and and like I said, that'll open it up so that that then uh, people get here. So then I'll do a little welcome, and we'll get going. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the October 2012 Polyphonic on Campus webinar. Uh, we're really glad to have you here with us, and I'm Steve Daniel from Polyphonic. And we're going to be having a really interesting webinar tonight with uh, Rachel Roberts, director of the Entrepreneurial Musicianship Program at the New England Conservatory of Music. And Rachel is going to be discussing what's next, educating musicians as entrepreneurs. Um, tonight's webinar is the second in a series of three webinars that we're having this fall. So in addition to tonight's webinar, we have our last one for the fall scheduled for November 19th. Um, and that's going to be titled, Classical Music is Dying, or Is It? Dun, dun, dun. So you'll definitely want to check that out. You can read more about that webinar and sign up on our website, holophonic.org slash on campus. And if you haven't been on the webinar part of our website before, we do have all of our webinars <coughs> recorded. So you can view previous webinars and um, share them with your friends and post them on Facebook and Twitter. And you know we appreciate you helping us uh, get the word out about these. So just a couple of logistics before we begin tonight. Um, your phone or computer audio is muted by default, just to cut down on background noise. Uh, but we absolutely encourage you to ask questions. And so there's two ways that you can ask a question. Um, the first way is if you'd actually like to have your audio unmuted and talk with us, ask a question, there's a yellow hand button on your webinar control panel. And if you press that yellow hand button, that will let us know that you'd like to be unmuted. And we'll go ahead and, and try to do that for you. Um, the other way to ask a question is to simply write a question into the question box. You'll see a little question box on your control panel there for the webinar. And if you type a question in there and send it in, then we'll uh, read it to Rachel and, and, and get her answer for you. Uh, we'll, we'll probably hold questions until the end if you send them in at any time. Um, but certainly, you're welcome to, to send them in freely and, and as many as you want. We'll, we'll try to. Uh, it's everything. Uh, so without any further ado, I, I do want to welcome Rachel Roberts, who we're very excited to have with us. And again, uh, Rachel is the Director of Entrepreneurial Musicianship at the New England Conservatory of Music in Boston. And at this point, I'll turn it to Rachel. All right. Well, hello, everyone. It's uh, great to be here this evening. And just to give you an overview of how I'd like to spend the next uh, 45 or 50 minutes, the time that we have remaining. I have a few things I'd like to talk through about entrepreneurship, some of what we do here at NEC, and just other thoughts on that word and that topic. But then I really would like this to be an open forum for conversation. What are the questions that all of you have um, related to your careers, related to the field, whatever have you? Um, I want this to be beneficial for you and that your time and your questions are answered uh, within the time that we've set aside tonight. So to begin, I have um, five ideas that I'd like to share with all of you about entrepreneurship. Um, these have come from my own thoughts and from observations and working with students these past few years. The first one is that when you think of entrepreneurship, it's really a mindset that you are your own business. Um, and the artistic creativity that we all have, that's the foundation for creating a successful career. Um, the, the thing that differentiates each one of us is what we do with those artistic, um, those artistic skills and ideas. You know, so in a way, you have to learn how to pay your own bills, how to put food on the table, yet still have the flexibility and creativity to pursue the music and the projects that you want. 
So it, you know, um, in conversation with some colleagues this weekend, others really agree in that being in business as a musician is like launching your own startup. You have costs, investment costs for educating yourself, and there's always continued learning um, that goes into the process, changes that happen along the way, your paths that evolve throughout the course of, of different projects that you may or may not be involved in. So the list goes on and on, and we can talk more about it, but in short, as a musician and as an artist, you are your own business. Um, the second point that I have is that as an entrepreneur, and, and frankly in, in any field I believe, it's a lifelong learning process. Being a musician and being an entrepreneur, it's not about the short-term gain. It's not like you're running a sprint. You're in there for the long haul. It's a marathon, you know? So when you have that kind of a mindset, you, you can't educate yourself just in four years or in six years. You can get a really great foundation of an education, but it's building this mindset of self-efficacy, you know? So if you have an idea for a project, but yet don't know the answers, how can you surround yourself with the resources to continue learning? And, and be successful in the projects that you do want to put together. Um, the third point that I'd like to make is that we all are very individualized. So often success is defined as one single path or it's very generalized. And I'm here at NEC and, and elsewhere, I'm really trying to break down those boundaries. Every one of us has our own unique path, our own interests, and our own goals. And that, in and of itself, is amazing because that's what allows creativity to flourish and all of these different art forms, concerts, productions, whatever have you, thrive. That's how it happens because we all are interested in different things. So don't be ashamed and don't compare yourself to others but look at yourself and accept your own strengths and your weaknesses. And if the weaknesses are something that you want to improve upon, by all means do that. But really focus on your strengths. What do you do well? What do you enjoy? And how can that play a part of what you choose to do in the future? Uh, the fourth point that I have is a phrase that I'm known for around NEC is hope is not a strategy. As a musician and as an entrepreneur, you can't just rely on hoping that things will happen. Instead, you need to set goals for yourself and plan for those goals. And if you fail, completely fine. In fact, I tell students quite a bit to fail early and fail often. Um, Success rarely happens on the very first time, but instead a project goes through many, many different reiterations to come to the final point or the final product that is viewed as quite successful for a wide audience. So again, hope is not a strategy. <laughs> and the last point that I'd like to make as when you're thinking about entrepreneurship is never give up on you. You know, there's so many places where you can fit in in this world or create your own avenues. But oftentimes that can seem overwhelming at different points. You know, I felt that throughout different points of my career. And I've seen students struggle with this while they're in school. But never give up on your own self. You have to believe in yourself. And you have to keep driving towards what you want to do. Be mindful about how you plan for it. And at the end of the day, you are the only person that can take care of yourself. And so if you don't do it, no one will do it for you. You can have others who will support you, but at the end of the day, the responsibility lies with you. So those are my five thoughts about entrepreneurship. When 
you're talking about the skills that make up entrepreneurship. Um, I'd like to share with you a bit of the work that we've been doing at New England Conservatory. We are working with students to develop uh, diverse offerings of, of learning. And uh, Stephen, if you wouldn't mind switching the screen on, I'll show you a little bit about what we're doing. If all of you can see this on your computer screens right now, um, we've just gone through a planning process to put a blueprint in place for the entrepreneurial musicianship department. And so it talks a little bit about what our mission is, some history of the EM department and how it's evolved. Uh, we officially launched in fall of 2010. And this is how our students have been engaged over the past couple years. In uh, the first year, we reached about 30% of the students. And the second year, we reached nearly 70% of the student population. And through all of this, we've identified two things that we want to educate our students on, the hard skills and the soft skills. The hard skills is what enables someone to perform a specific task or activity. They're very tactical, and you can teach them. And the soft skills are ones that are more inherent within uh, each individual's personality. And so it varies quite a bit. And the ways that you teach those or gain these skills are quite different. What you see right now is this Venn diagram of hard skills and soft skills. And this is how we have chosen to look at entrepreneurship and say this is what we would like to offer our students. With the hard skills, they're very traditional, tactical classes that we have and, and will have. We don't have all of these today. This is a plan for the future. But the classes that we hope to have and some that we do have addressing legal issues, how to develop a website, what are different methods of financial planning, you know, and et cetera. If you go over to the right side, these soft skills, these are more of the skills that are inherent within different people's personalities. Some people have, have really great communication skills, others don't. And, and the soft skills are a bit harder to teach. It's not that you can't teach them like the hard skills, it just takes a much more nuanced approach based on the individual that you're working with and where they are in the spectrum. What's in the middle is where these hard and the soft skills overlap. And much of the, the middle part of these hard and soft skills revolves around some kind of a communication focus, whether it's writing, speaking, interviewing, any of the above. It's about communicating who you are and getting someone excited about, about you or your music. The communications idea is a big idea here at NEC, and this is one of the things that we focus on with all of our students here. We have one required course for all undergraduates, and we have a series of elective courses that are in place and, and will be in place in the coming few years. But then there's also a great deal of work going on to integrate these skills and concepts that are on your screen in front of you within the curriculum that already exists. Instead of adding on more and more and more to a student's workload, we're trying to slightly refocus the lens, whether it's with the classroom faculty or the performance faculty, for how to integrate these skills into the curriculum that already exists. And the communications piece is the one across the board uh, that we are first able to do. Um, so you may be asking, OK, how, how does all of this play out? How do we educate the students? And how do we get them planning so that they can embody this idea of entrepreneurship? Right now I've pulled up our NEC website. And if you have your own time and want to uh, go through here, this gives a great summary of what the EM department is about. You'll see up here it's necmusic.edu backslash EM. I won't make you spell entrepreneurship. 
Um, but this gives a sense of who we are. And over here on these drop-down menu, we have an advising component. This gives you a description of our courses, the grants, which I'll come back to this in a moment. We have some internships and fellowships, um, a few paid opportunities for students, and then resources, uh, other resources and workshops. And we also have a blog if you're interested, uh, reading about who we are and what we do. The biggest overarching theme through everything that we have in the EM department is about um, experiential learning. Everyone is individualized, everyone is different, so there's no one path that a student will go through that looks exactly the same as someone else. If you go further on through here, this list, um, I'm sorry, I'm going fast. These are the four different focuses that we have for EM, curricular and co-curricular initiatives, our advising component, project-based initiatives, and our professional opportunities. And this gives you a summary of the first five years of the EM department. Even though all of this is launched right now here in year three, there's no single path that a student takes to go through all of this learning. It's incredibly individualized. And all of these different components, all of these different components are access points, entry points for the diverse student body of 750 students at NEC. I'd like to share with you back to the grants. This is probably our most visible component of what we do. Um, the grant opportunity is modeled after a professional grant that a student or that a professional would find. And we work with them on the writing, on finances, on timelines, and on articulating their projects. It's a uh, once the application is submitted, we then work with the student to uh, make a formal presentation to a committee that's five minutes long. We coach them on how to present and how to speak. And then once the grant is awarded, they are paired with one or two entrepreneurial advisors to work through the project with. And the advisors help to build the different skills that the student may need for the project or that we identify that they could benefit from. It's a highly individualized process. Um, all of the grants that we have awarded are listed over here on the left, including if you go to the completed projects, this shows all of them, um, even the ones that are finished, as the title suggests. To date, we have funded 45 student grants in just two years, so it's pretty exciting. And one student will get involved, and it will have this ripple effect throughout the school in involving other students and other departments and other faculty members. One grant that I'd like to highlight and just talk a bit about the skills that were learned is from this moment you see on the screen, Colin Thurman. He was awarded a grant, an initial grant, in 2010. And I'm switching over to his website right now, Touch Performance Art. This uh, project has just taken off. He did one concert back in 2010, learned a great deal from it. Um, the concert experience, if I were to describe it to you, is that they've taken traditional classical music and worked with a composer from NEC and rearranged it into acoustic or into electronic dance club music. So you hear the themes from the classical music, but it's set in a club setting, and it combines um, different artists who are classically trained as ballet dancers, as musicians. They have an aerialist. It's a club experience that happens in a club, but Colin did the first reiteration in 2010. Um, was a successful project, but he learned a lot from it, which is what we hope everything, all of what we provide students will do. You know, going back to hope is not a strategy, fail early, fail often, and keep revising. What's a good idea? So Colin has done this. 
and he did a second performance at a different venue in town. He learned he needed to have a smaller venue size. He performed again in February, and it was a huge success. Sold out, and the club that he performed at actually booked him for a series of concerts um, during the beginning of the school year this year. So he had six sold out shows, and then from there was booked at um, La Poche en Rouge in New York City as well. So this is just one example of a project. Not all of the projects have been as visible or as successful, but they all have had an equal amount of learning. Um, if you go to this website, touchperformanceart.com, you can see the videos and, and kind of get a better sense of what Colin's project is about. And they partnered with the DJ. The gentleman that you see here is actually a classically trained orchestral percussionist who graduated from NEC. He's a DJ, calls himself the WIG, and he's the DJ that works with this group. So again, it's a very individualized, um, experiential course of learning that we have, even in the classroom, to help build these different skills that students identify with. Um, anyhow, I think I'm done with the screen at the moment, if you want to turn that off. Um, and I'm happy to talk further about any of this, but I would love to hear what questions are on all of your mind after, after going through these five kind of mindsets that I share of entrepreneurship and some of the skills and how we view it here at NEC. I'd be curious to hear your questions and, and what what interests you? Oh, great. Well, Rachel, we have, we have a few questions that have come in here. Um, and I was actually wondering this as well. Uh, in terms of the students, you, I know at NEC you said you know, that the second year you were able to reach significantly more students. Um, are, are any of those classes or elements of the program required for students? Um, or is it purely, if they're interested in it, how does that work? Sure. That's a great question. There is one required component. There's one class that all undergraduates take. And that's been a part of the program since we launched in 2010. Uh, the class is required typically of juniors. Sometimes they wait until their senior year to take the course. And it's it's called the Entrepreneurial Musician. It's an overview of what the mindsets and skills are for entrepreneurship. We work with the students heavily on communication skills and public speaking. We touch on finances, both organizational or project finance, and their own personal finance. And then we have a, a few weeks on mental and physical health and how to take care of yourself. So that is the only required component. The rest are elective classes, workshops, um, different sessions, advising sessions, and that growth between 30% and 70% was not of required classes. It was just of student involvement with the offerings that we continue to build and grow here. Does that answer your question? Great. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And another question that's sort of related here is, um, for students, do they get credit for those courses, or uh, you know, how how does that work? I know it's in different programs, uh, you know, it's, it can work different ways. Sure, all of the courses that we have are re are uh, credit bearing courses. Um, the internships that we have, the student can register for zero or one credit. Any internship, we have a few different ones. There's ones that are educationally based. There's ones that are arts administration based. And then we launched a new type of internship um, uh, two years ago that combines both the administration side of organizations and pairs it with actual professional rehearsal and performance experience with the organization that we partnered with. So all three types of those internships are credit-bearing, a student can register for. 
We have a fellowship program that's just brand new this year, a marketing fellowship program. The so student is working with our marketing department, the EM department, and the ensemble that they're playing in. The first one that we chose is the chamber orchestra. And the student uh, spends some time working with us for the entire year and being a part of developing marketing strategies in both the development and the implementation of it. And that fellowship is common a small amount throughout the year. Um, but a student receives a small amount in recognition of the work that they are doing. And then the rest of what we have to offer, the grant program, uh, the workshops, the advising, that is all through a student's own election to go through it. Great, great. Um, it, it, on a totally different topic, um, another question here is, what is your favorite part of your job? <laughs> That's a really great question. The, and, and for me, easy to answer. The favorite part of my job is working with the students. They are so creative and so inspiring. Um, and even when they come in with different challenges, it's really fun to sit down with them and figure out a plan to work through them and to come out stronger on the other end. So it's incredibly inspiring to work with students every day. And I'll have to say it gets kind of quiet during the summer when they aren't around. I'm ready for them to come back. So I, I do also enjoy working with the faculty and being creative and finding ways to integrate this idea of entrepreneurship within what already exists. They have been a tremendous support um, and quite enthusiastic in, in many different ways. So it's a fun place to be at NEC, incredibly creative right now. There's a lot going on. Um, but by far, my most favorite part is working, working with the students. Great, great. Another question here is um, there seems to be more and more of these types of programs popping up at, at schools around the country and just how do you feel about that? Um, obviously it seems like a, an important part, growing important part of uh, a musician's education and obviously NEC is, is one of the uh, you know pioneers of this, this type of program. Um, where do you see it going? Obviously growing at other schools, that sort of thing. Sure. This was actually a part of the conversation that happened this weekend during the ALP 15th anniversary celebration. It was one of the questions we had yesterday. And I think it's a really great question. There is a lot happening right now in music education. And it's exciting to see programs popping up everywhere, whether it's a full department or whether it's courses or advising, projects, grants, you name it. It's fantastic that it's happening. You know, Eastman, I think, was the first one to have anything with their arts leadership program and then the Institute for Music Leadership. And NEC, I think, was one of the next ones to have a specific department just for entrepreneurship. We began in fall of 2010, but Juilliard has just launched something. I know Oberlin has a grant program. Manhattan School of Music also has a program, an entrepreneurship program. I believe it's in its second year now. And there's a tremendous, um, let's see, I think Curtis is also doing something with 8th Blackbird that has just begun this year in the vein of entrepreneurship. Um, there's a tremendous amount happening, and I think that is just fantastic. This type of education, these types of discussions, frankly, should be happening more and more and more as a vital part of an education. And to me, what's most important isn't all of the hard skills. It's more the overarching mindset that you are your own business and it's a lifelong learning process. You know, because if, if that is instilled within you as part of education, um, you can go out and, and find the resources and find what you need to learn or take classes to educate yourself to succeed. You know, I think it's similar to anything else in life. You get out of it what you put in it. And entrepreneurship is absolutely the same way. When you look at startups, there's 
It's the drive of the person running the business. As a musician, that's you. And it may seem overwhelming, but again, going back to the work with students, I see this in their eyes so many times. They're like, how do I do all of this? But if you sit down and really break it out, what are the different steps? Change does not happen overnight. Change happens step by step by step by step. And then you look back, and you've actually climbed the mountain. You know? So to me, the most important thing is that this conversation of entrepreneurship is happening. And I think it, it has a tremendous amount of room to grow, but it's exciting to see, and maybe I picked up on it just because the word entrepreneur is in my title. But in the past two or three years, I feel like this conversation has really risen into the spotlight among faculty awareness and among student awareness, which is in turn driving administrations to um, to develop these types of courses and programs. Great. Another interesting question here is, um, and you, you sort of touched on this a little bit, but do you find that students are drawn to these opportunities, interested in these opportunities, even though honing their musicianship skills is certainly their focus? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the challenge. And, you know, I I came in here talking with faculty members saying, well, I can relate to this because I was a student, too, at Eastman and went through the arts leadership program. And I had to balance my time. I feel my performing to slip. But at the end of the day, I was very, very grateful that I took the time to spend in the arts leadership program and the courses that they offered. There's always hesitation, especially with faculty members and supporting this and saying, you know, my student really needs to be spending time practicing. I get that. Completely get that. And sometimes it's just not feasible to think that a student will have the time to go to these types of conversations until after school. After school, when they're out in the real world, they'll recognize <laughs> that this is happening and what do I do? And so EM is actually looking at ways to have forums for alumni to get involved and, and gain some of this education that they may not have taken a part of uh, while they are at school. So I think that's one viable option. Um, but here's a story for you from another student. We had some guests coming in to visit NEC, and we were talking with them about the EM program. We were talking with them about a number of things, but specifically the EM program, and we invited three students to come in and share their experiences with their grants. Uh, one was an undergraduate, one was a graduate, and one was a DMA student. And the undergraduate um, put together an opera, and it was quite successful. They put together Into the Woods, it's something not typically programmed here at NEC. She got her colleagues together with her to program and do everything from the staging and the props to the rehearsal and performance, writing, sound, and, and you name it. They did it from start to finish, and it was fantastic. After these three students finished talking to the guests that were in, one of the, the guests turned to them and said, you three seem like students who would just naturally walk through this door. What about the students that are in the practice room and thinking that this program isn't for them or that they don't have time? The student, the undergrad student who put together this program jumped on that question and she said, that was me. That was completely me. I thought that I didn't have time for this, that this program wasn't for me, that I, I wouldn't ever be able to take a part and she said, but then one of my friends received a grant, and I got involved with his grant and started thinking, well, I have some ideas, too. Why can't I make this happen? So it was just the best answer that she had, and it was so heartfelt. But I think a lot of students, when they see more activity like this going on, they're able to identify with those examples and take a part in it, saying, you know, I have an idea, too. 
why can't I explore this? So again, it's very individualized and students have their own access points into it. It's unrealistic to think that I, I could reach 100% of the student population. I would love to, absolutely love that, but I think that is unrealistic. So um, we're on an upward trajectory. I hope that continues. And there's resources out there. Even if students graduate and realize they missed some of this, this dialogue is happening all over the place. Great. Well, that's actually a perfect segue into another question here, um, which is, um, what if a school does not have a musician entrepreneurship program? What resources could you recommend in that case? Sure. Hmm. If a school does not have an entrepreneurship program, you know, I try talking. All right. To clarify the question, does the school have a music department? I, I'm guessing you're involved in a music department. Is that correct? We can we can give the person a second to write that again, but I assume, yeah. yeah they, okay. They, yeah. So I'll assume yes until you cut me off and tell me otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what I would encourage you to do is take a look at some of the faculty members that are teaching and see what kind of projects they are involved in. You know, do they have their own performance series? Do they have some kind of community outreach program? Are they touring? Are they traveling? Do they have entrepreneurial projects that they are involved in? And I'm certain there's at least one, probably more, but I'm certain there's at least one. And, and pull them aside and have a side conversation. Say, how did you get into this? What does it mean to you? Um, that would be one option, is to build individual relationships and get some kind of ongoing dialogue. A second option that I would recommend is to look into uh, the organization called Arts Enterprise. It was started at University of Michigan by some students, and they pair with, uh, I believe, students in the business school as well to have conversations and make projects happen relating to art and culture and business. It's a really great organization. It's all student run, and so that could be an opportunity for this individual to, you know, have their own entrepreneurial venture by bringing Arts Enterprise to their campus. It's at a very low cost investment, I believe, and you have the support of a nationwide network with other students. Um, there's, uh, I think, about a dozen chapters or so across the country, and they have a national workshop every year. I went to one to check it out in Kansas City, Missouri a few years ago, and it was fantastic. The students are so passionate, and they talk about these issues all the time. So that would be my second option. My third recommendation would be if you're at a school who has or that has uh, different departments outside of music, in finance or business, journalism, law, take a look at their course offerings. This idea of entrepreneurship is spreading and is appearing in all different types of, of uh, careers that are out there. Everyone is kind of going through a change right now, somewhat spurred by the economy. But a lot of these different fields also have similar discussions. I found some of the most beneficial learning since being at NEC and developing this program has been talking with those other disciplines to see how they're addressing it, what those topics of conversations are, and how they are reaching their students. So even if there's not a specific department where you're at for entrepreneurship, I think there's ways to tap into this conversation nationally um, with different faculty members from, from different, different places. You know, And if nothing else, Email me. I'd be happy to have a conversation with you and, and see what we could do. <laughs> Sounds great. Um, another question here is related to the grant program um, that the DM office that you were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. um, it says, how do you identify the mentors for the grant program? Sure. That's a great question. We have a base uh, 
of over just over 150 entrepreneurial advisors. And the advisors are matched with students in the grant program, as well as students who go through the course that's required as an undergraduate. The advisors are um, from our own networks, people who we have identified or come across who are really excellent in their field. We have NEC staff members, NEC faculty, NEC alumni, but then we also have other professionals in the field. Some are in the music field, some are in other fields, um, but they all have an affinity for music, um, a passion for what we're doing here, and I'd say, I'd say probably 75% of that group we have cultivated ourselves and through different conversations or contacts, we've asked if they, if they would be willing to mentor a student or have a conversation or two with them. And I'd say about 25% of that group have volunteered themselves. They've heard about the program and said, wow, what can I do to help? How can I be involved? So um, it's been a really nice mix. And we have quite a diverse group. We are always looking to grow that base. Of, of the network that we have to diversify what the backgrounds are that people can speak to, just so we can have a broader um, selection for students to choose from and, and make some networking and connections with. Excellent. Um, so, sort of a related question, um, although I, get, I think this is more directly for you, is what professional networks do you connect with to stay current on these issues? Yeah, that's, that's huge. There's no one source of where to go. But that said, there are some places that I, I really check frequently. Um, one great resource is called Arts Journal. And it's a daily publication that is emailed to you that collates all the big ideas and articles that are in the news within the past 24 hours. Um, it is a fantastic resource, and it, it brings to my attention a lot of the articles that are trending that may relate to the different ideas that we're discussing. And again, that name is Arts Journal. Um, if you type that into Google, it will come up immediately, and you'll find it. Another resource, my background is in orchestras, <laughs> and that's where I worked until I came here at NEC. So another resource that I would offer is the League of American Orchestras. They also have a newsletter. I think it's emailed once a week, and you can sign on if you're a member, which if you're a student, it's a very low-cost way to access information in the field. The League of American Orchestras has a national conference every year. They discuss these types of ideas and issues, especially the ones that are facing organizations right now in the arts. Um, I'd also encourage you to look at other trade organizations. Um, Opera, Opera America, Chorus America. I'm not as familiar with what they have, um, but I know it's the same type of networking and resource as the League of American Orchestras. And the last part of what I would offer is trying to keep connections alive. Um, networking is huge, absolutely huge. That's probably the number one thing. That's how I've gotten every job that I've had in my career is, is through networking. It's not just the mission of a resume and cover letter and saying, yes, I'd like this job. Um, it's through some kind of a personal connection. And I think the same is true for how I stay engaged with all of these conversations. It's through people that I've met, um, people that I've worked with, um, those who I've come across in, in one forum or another. And it's not that I have to talk with them every week or every month, but to stay in some kind of regular communication, or especially when there's a, a fascinating article that came out, something in the news, Maybe send them a quick note and say, hey, do you have time for coffee? Or can I call you? I, I really have this question and want to get your opinion on it. You know, um, 
there's there's a lot happening in the industry. It's hard to stay on top of it all, but if you can connect into a few different channels that are really reliable resources and have your own network at the same time, I think you'll you'll develop a really well-rounded perspective of what's going on. Great. Yeah, that's very helpful. Um, just one thing that I thought of that I wanted to interject, if I could, which sure. I want to get your thoughts on. Um, you mentioned the the ALP workshop this weekend that both of us were at, and one of the things that really stuck with me that I wanted to ask you about was um, one of the presenters mentioning when talking about entrepreneurship that um, entrepreneurs tend to sort of think at think from the end. I think was oh. sort of the way that she put it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they think about the end, um, you know, where where the end is and think about, you know, what that's gonna look like, um, sort of picture that. And I thought that was really interesting. It wasn't necessarily something that I thought about before, but it's simple. Mm -hmm. And I just was curious your thoughts on that and that you know, I'm sure maybe you've come across that before, but um, you know, those kinds of simple ways of, of the mindset that you're talking about, um, I think can be really valuable. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I think I may have said it in passing earlier about always keeping the goal in mind, but that's kind of the same idea. You know, you have the end result, what do you want to happen? And then work backwards and let that help guide your planning for whatever your project is, the idea is, whatever it may be. Um, I, I just nodded and smiled when Melissa said that this weekend. I thought, yes, that's exactly it. You know, you have to know what the end is and plan for that. And as you plan, you kind of work backwards to get the steps in order. It's absolutely true. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, and, and one other resource, polyphonic.org. <laughs> <laughs> that has really great articles and commentary from other leaders in the field, young voices, uh, more distinguished older voices as well. It's really a great resource um, to hear about what's going on in the industry and what people's views are of it. So that's, I can't believe that wasn't the first thing that I said, but it's really a great resource. Uh, we, we appreciate that. And, and yeah, to, you know, to add to that, I mean, we did relaunch uh, a new site just within the last couple of months, and so it is, you know, very easy to find things, and uh, you can search our website for, you know, anything music and orchestral related, and, and you'll probably find an article or two on it. So we hope that it's we hope that it's a beneficial resource for you. Um, so moving on, a few more questions here. Sure. Um, this, this one is related to, uh, I guess, EM curriculum in a way. Uh, it says, do you have any new courses, programs, or workshops that you're hoping to add in the future? Sure. Um, I just had two courses approved to be launched this spring that I'm really excited about. One is a marketing class, Marketing One-on-One. -on -one. And I've, I've gotten the CEO of a local marketing company to teach it, founder and CEO of um, Hall & Mark Marketing. And Chris, the CEO, is teaching the course. He's the one who, um, I believe, did the marketing for uh, Zip Cars. So that gives you some sense. And it's a Boston-based company. He's so excited to work with musicians, and I just think it's a really awesome match. So that's a new course that will be coming up. There's also another course of um, music and law, music copyright law, that will be starting in January. The founder of IMSLP, that website, is actually an NEC alum. He was a composition major and started that website in his, quote, spare time as an undergraduate major. And he was uh, encountering legal issues and, and being threatened to be sued as a student for starting this website. 
He believed that he was absolutely in the green, not doing anything wrong. So after he graduated, he went to Harvard Law School and got a law degree. And this past May, just graduated, just took the bar exam, and is practicing music, uh, music and entertainment law over in Cambridge. So he's the one teaching that class I'm so excited about. Those will be really great offerings for students. Then I'm proposing um, a few more classes for next fall. Next on the docket will be a communications class, really focusing on skills needed for effective communications. And the other class that I'd like to propose is some kind of a DIY class. If you have an ensemble, if you have a project, how do you put it together as a DIY project and make it successful? So those are kind of the next four upcoming ones. I'll probably, um, I haven't looked beyond next fall, but I have two more. I have a bunch more, but I need to narrow it down to two more to launch next spring as well. So that series of rotating uh, classes up and, and offered for students. Sounds wonderful. <laughs> um, I, we probably have time for one more question, so I'm going to give you a save the heart for last. Okay. Um, this, this is a great question here, and it says, um, how do you balance the need to make a living and the desire to create or build something from the ground up that may not be lucrative in the early stages? Yep. That's a very real question. I think anyone that embarks on a music career needs to understand it's not easy, but it is doable. And this is where the idea of the entrepreneur comes in. You know, as an entrepreneur, if you study business entrepreneurship, it's all about the startup. And to me, the question that was just asked is about the startup. Um, when people start up companies, oftentimes they're working another job, they're doing something else so they can pay the bills until they're at that tipping point where it switches and they can focus solely on the business that they have in front of them. And sometimes it happens in, in a short order, other times it happens years, you know. Um, nothing's ever predictable <laughs> and sometimes the best laid plans do not work at all, and so you have plan B and plan C and plan D. But the one thing that I would offer for you to think about is being a musician and being an entrepreneur is a choice between having a career in music or a life in music. And I use those terms very carefully. Having a career in music means that you're doing something very specific and very defined. Having a life in music often means that you broaden your perspective of what's possible. So if you have a startup, what do you need to do to get that to be successful for the long term? It's not just a, for a finite period of time, but it's for the long haul, you know? So it's not easy, but I, I believe if you surround yourself with the right people, and the right resources and plan for it in a very thoughtful way, it's possible to do, very possible to do. And oftentimes the end result is that you will be even more satisfied with the artistic creativity and freedom that you have. Great. Yeah, absolutely wonderful advice. So I want to, at this time, thank Rachel for taking the time to be with us this evening and tell us about what's going on at NEC and, and uh, answer all our questions. And obviously thank you for, for being here and, and tuning in and spending your part of your evening with us. Um, you bet. It's my pleasure. It's very fun. And, and I'll offer it again if anyone has any questions. I'd be more than happy to find time to speak offline as well or share more of what we're doing at NEC. And can you just remind us of the, the website address, just if people want to check that out? Sure. Our website is necmusic.edu backslash 
EM, which is an entrepreneurial musician. And there you can find all of our contact information and poke around more as to the classes that we have, the grants that have been awarded, all the different workshops that we're bringing in. Um, NECmusic.edu backslash EM. Great. It'll be fun to, you know, we'll, we'll have to check back with Rachel uh, in the future and, and, you know, do that again and, and see where you are and all the cool things you're doing. And uh, it'll, it'll, be, it'll be fun to keep up with what's going on there. Sure. Anytime. Thank you for coordinating this and pulling it together. It's been fun. Yeah, absolutely. So just to remind people, we do have one more fall webinar coming up in November, so check our website for details on that and sign up, and we hope to, to see you then. And uh, until next time, thanks again to Rachel Roberts, and hope everyone has a wonderful evening.